Welcome back to the Hannibal Retrospective with episode 4, Earth. Or is that Kerf? Even the show wasn't really sure. It stems from a quirk of the French language. Instead of O and E, they use the digraph for both, leading to the sound E. And the O and the E together kind of look like a C at the beginning. That's where the miscommunication arose, so NBC mistitled the episode. But that was just the start of this episode's problems. Episode 4 was originally supposed to air on April 25th, 2013. However, because the episode involves children, Brian Fuller decided to pull the episode from American TV due to things like Sandy Hook happening around the same time. So originally, this episode didn't air at all and was replaced with six web-based minisodes focused solely on the main characters without the Murder of the Week plot, which is a lot of effort to go through. The episode did eventually become available on home release, of course. And on top of that, this episode has been commented to me personally many times as the, quote, worst episode of the show. Which, considering the last episode had its most basic facts fundamentally and laughably wrong, that's a low bar I feel this episode doesn't dip below. But let's find out and get into it. This is episode 4, Earth. The episode opens with a session between Will and Hannibal, and the conversation is almost entirely lifted from the novels, but they didn't just take dialogue. At night, I leave the lights on in my little house, walk across the flat fields. The house is like a boat on the sea. That's actually verbatim from Thomas Harris's own introduction to the Red Dragon novel. It works really well for Will's character and foreshadowing his future with boats. Also, it gives the show a nice connection to the author by putting his words in the characters' mouths. But that's not the only connection to Red Dragon here. Hannibal quickly shifts the conversation to Garrett Jacob Hobbs, asking Will if his home and environment spoke to him. Which is again, dialogue from Red Dragon. Except there, they were talking about the Tooth Fairy. Will says he could see Hobbs with alarming clarity, as we get a flashback to Hobbs saying exactly that to him. The use of Will's understanding of the Tooth Fairy is quite cleverly implemented. However, and I am getting way ahead of myself here, this will have problems for Season 3 when the Tooth Fairy is finally introduced, because they've already used that dialogue, and as such have less places to go with it. But that is way down the line. It is important to note here, though. Hannibal is directing the conversation quite deliberately, first getting Will to think about Hobbes, and then asking him about Abigail's friend, who Hannibal killed. And Will gives Hannibal exactly what he wants, by saying he not only felt guilty for her death, but he felt like he killed her. Hannibal asks if Will felt like he was becoming Garrett Jacob Hobbes. Not Garrett Jacob Hobbes, Dr. Lecter. And that little look from Lecter, almost him saying, we shall see as we lead into the opening credits. Last episode, Hannibal was laying the groundwork for what we're seeing here. He wants Will to think like Garrett Jacob Hobbs, not just because he wants a convenient scapegoat, but because he's looking for that kindred spirit. And although he seems very much in control, I do believe Lecter is struggling with the finer details of understanding Will's mind. After the credits, we're greeted with quite the grisly tableau and four members of the family shot dead in their seats. Will is already there as his pendulum swings, restoring the meal. What Will sees is a person obsessed with family values, and even correctly assumes that the killer brought other people to the home invasion, and then again correctly states that the family was killed simultaneously, except for the mother. This is a bit strange to me, because although Will is quite the savant with this kind of thing, I'm not sure that that's possible. Time of death calculations aren't that accurate, so that can't be the reason. Forensic evidence could potentially show multiple bullet casings from multiple guns, but it's the simultaneous part, apart from the mother, that has me scratching my head. Yes, he is right. However, that doesn't make it any less speculation, and it just seems like he's read the script. Will then sees the mother being shot by the person seemingly in charge of the home invasion, and is then brought out of his recreation by Jack. Elsewhere, a car is pulling up to Will's house, which is of course Hannibal's car, because it's a Bentley, and in the Hannibal novel, I believe it's stated Lecter's car of choice, pre-capture, is a supercharged Bentley. 
And this scene is quite deliberately framed in a way that Hannibal is seen as an intruder here, looking through the windows and using sausages to keep the dogs quiet while he looks around, getting a good insight into Will's mind, no doubt. And Lecter finds Will's fishing laws, even making his own additions to one. It wouldn't be too much of a stretch to see a big metaphor here. Will is trying to catch Hannibal, and yet Hannibal is right there with him, and here Hannibal is literally helping with Will's fishing laws. Like I said, not too big of a stretch. Also, fishing will be used constantly as a metaphor for the hunt for Lecter throughout the show. Lecter then pricks his thumb on the hook, possibly as a mark of his work. And of course, the metaphor appears again, with Hannibal intentionally putting himself on the hook, but never being caught by it. Also, it needs to be noted that Mads Mikkelsen actually did that. It's not a special effect. But to be honest, I expect nothing less from the man. And back at the crime scene, Jack goes over the facts. And I do find it funny that you've got people photographing and collecting evidence while Jack and Will casually discuss the details around them. Why do they need to be there and completely in the way? Because ideally, they'd be walking on stepping plates on the floor of the crime scene to prevent contamination. So it's just impractical to have a conversation there. But this is TV world where this happens a lot. I can't promise I won't bring this up again, but I'll try not to get too annoying with these little details. Anyway, Jack talks about the family and notes that the youngest disappeared a year prior. And when Zeller mentions the main shooter would have been crouching in order to get a low angle, Will starts formulating another theory. We then shift again, this time to Abigail, who's looking at the scar her father gave her, talking to Bloom about hiding it, who doesn't want Abigail to hide, but to share what happened to her and to come to terms with it. Abigail complains about the support group she's in, acting quite superior to it all, but Bloom urges her to continue, saying she needs someone to confide in to stop becoming isolated. So of course, we then shift to Hannibal working in his office. There's a knock at the door, and it's Bloom who casually asks for a beer from Hannibal. Which is quite possibly the most normal interaction Lecter has had so far in the show. So over drinks, Bloom and Lecter discuss Abigail, with Hannibal suggesting perhaps Abigail should be released from treatment. Bloom is quick to say that Hannibal as a surrogate for Abigail is a bad idea, who lets the idea go. For now, anyway. Back at the FBI, everyone is gathered around the bodies discussing their families. If you haven't seen it already, family is a big theme of the episode. The name itself, Uff, Egg, a clear reference to that. And I shall go more into that as things are revealed. Will sees a picture of Mrs. Turner and notes that there's forgiveness on her face, which finishes his previous thought at the crime scene that the person at the head of the table was her missing son. It's then back to more psychiatry between Will and Hannibal. He starts with the most standard of questioning, asking about Will's mother, who rejects the question altogether and turns it on to Lecter, asking about his mother. We then learn that his parents did indeed die when he was young, and interestingly, he says he was adopted by his uncle Robertus. It's interesting because in the novel Hannibal Rising, Lecter doesn't meet his uncle after his parents' death. He meets his aunt, Lady Morosaki, but she's not mentioned here. So I feel that Lecter's backstory has changed in some way. Morosaki is still mentioned in the show, though. Also, interestingly, the role of Hannibal's uncle was supposed to go to David Bowie in season two, but he didn't take the role and the character never appeared. The conversation is soon shifted to Abigail and how she has a lot in common with the two of them, which of course, depending on your perspective, could mean several different things. Will says he never connected to the concept of family, but Hannibal counters by saying he created his own. And I like how only now we learn this. Oh, I, well, I connected a family of strays. And thank you for feeding them while I was away. I find it quite funny that it took this long for them to explain that. They made it look like Hannibal was up to no good, and left it just long enough for us to think, yeah, he's up to no good. But what's more interesting about this conversation, Hannibal mentions Will making his own family, who then starts talking about his dogs. However... I was referring to Abigail. 
You could argue that Hannibal is trying to make Will see Abigail as family because that's what he wants. But I think Hannibal can see that Will wants that too, and it takes Hannibal pointing it out as a possibility for Will to actually consider it. Will and Lecter briefly talk about the murders, defining the killer by motherhood, with Lecter taking it a step further. That motherhood, the perversion of it. I'm thinking back to when this episode was originally supposed to air and how these conversations were used for the webisodes with the murders removed. And I can't help thinking that unless you see the actual horror inflicted by this killer, then do these conversations lose their weight? And if they do, that might explain the low opinion of this episode. And with its absence from the last episode, it's nice to get another food scene with Hannibal and Jack with us learning that Hannibal is quite the historian when it comes to food, as he serves Jack a modified boudinoir from Alibab's Gastronomie Pratique. For a bit of context, Alibab was the pseudonym for Henri Babinski, and the cookbook Gastronomie Pratique was published in 1907. Although it had a lot of recipes, it also contained the history about the recipes and the food used. It was so extensive, in fact, that the 1928 edition was over a thousand pages long. And in fact, Alibab was one of the main influences to modern French cuisine, along with another favourite chef of Lecter's, Escoffier. So a very Lecter book indeed. Lots of history and classic French recipes. There's zero reason for Hannibal to tell Jack where he got the recipe from, so I feel there's a bit of showing off there. Also, you know how I enjoy little details like that. And there continues to be little winks to the audience when Jack asks about what he's about to eat, and Hannibal says it's rabbit. He should have hopped faster. <laughs> yes, he should have. <laughs> I think this may be the first direct statement that they're eating human. Previously, it's always been implied, albeit heavily, but there's no doubt here. Jack mentions that Will seems haunted, and thinks that the case might have parallels with Abigail, and he still suspects that Abigail had something to do with Hobbes' murders, and thinks, or perhaps hopes, Will is starting to see that too. Jack's instincts that something else is going on can't be denied here, and I think ordinarily Will would be exactly where he thinks he should be. However, Hannibal is muddying the waters a bit and making it difficult. Back at the FBI, there's some good old forensics going on, as they have analysed all the footprints at the Turner's home, and have found three young footprints that don't match. And Jimmy has managed to match some found fingerprints too. Which, by the way, is nowhere near that quick in reality, but as I said, I'll try and restrain myself. At the same time, Will is giving a lecture, and his subject might sound familiar. For some killers, biting may be a fighting pattern as much as a sexual behaviour. He's talking about killers biting their victims. It's not clear if he's talking about a specific case, but you'll remember that biting was a big focus in the Tooth Fairy case. But before anything else can be said, Jack interrupts, dismissing the class, telling Will what Jimmy found, that the fingerprint was from another missing child who came from a big family. So they're going to check on this new family, suspecting another bloodbath. And as soon as they enter the house, they're hit by the smell of putrefaction, finding the family dead just like the Turners, but with a difference, as the mother was shot twice, with the first bullet not being fatal and Will suspects that this mistake led to the missing son also being killed with his family, being disowned by his new family. And in a restaurant, we finally meet this new killer family, the surrogate mother seemingly quite loving to her kids, but there is an obvious air of menace around everything, with the oldest of the boys keeping the others in line. And it quickly takes a chilling turn when the quote-unquote mother tells one of the boys that he's going home to say goodbye to his family. As we get to see more of Abigail's story, we'll start to see how it's not that much different from this killer family, and perhaps the show is trying to illustrate where her story may end. We then get another moment between Katz and Will discussing the missing boys. It's not particularly relevant since it doesn't go anywhere, just Will speculating the boys may have ADHD. However, Katz does say the extra bullet that was used in the most recently found murder has been matched to another previous shooting where they found the oldest of the three children came from. At first, suspecting that he's the leader, but it just doesn't add up, displaying no sadistic or psychopathic tendencies. 
We then see the boy, CJ, with his new family in a convenience store, and it's pretty obvious that one of the younger boys is incredibly scared of him. This, however, will be something that goes absolutely nowhere, because this episode is one of two that had some reshoots done after season one was completed. And as such, things like this were left in, but no longer apply to the new version of the episode. So it's just a bit of a dead end. Back with Will, it's time for another appointment with Lecter, bearing a gift for Abigail, which he's decided to not give to her, distancing himself at the last minute. And this is a perfect example of the conflict between what Hannibal wants and what people like Bloom are advising should be done. Will's gift is fly-making gear, which they both agree that teaching Abigail to fish when her father taught her to hunt would be a bad idea. Will is also angry at the missing boys and being unable to help them, and you can see the moment of inspiration on Hannibal's face, as he knows Abigail is someone Will can help. And perhaps it's our responsibility. It wasn't mine to help her find her way. At least that's what he says. There's something quite insidious about that moment from Lecter. You can see how he takes that emotional moment of Will's and uses it to get what he wants, which is Abigail close to him and Will, not just because he feels like the three should be together in whatever form that might be, but also to keep her in check and manipulate her just like he's manipulating Will. And Lecter is quick to act after that, even getting Abigail to claim he's one of her guardians, so she can leave with him. And it's clear her trauma still runs deep as she recounts nightmares of her friend that was murdered, and of Nicholas Boyle's dead body. And you can see Hannibal subtly twisting that knife in. Crime scene photos of Nicholas Boyle. Gutted. How you left him? I do think little comments like that from Lecter are significant, because they're small enough to be missed, but they carry enough weight to keep Abigail vulnerable and obedient, poking her with the stick of, I know what you did. And I'm sure it's not accidental to see a small smile on Hannibal's face after this line. I just have to get used to lying. Abigail also asks, because she can live with her actions, if she is a sociopath. But Lecter tells her that that makes her a survivor, which I'm sure is how he would refer to himself sometimes as well. Back at Hannibal's home, he gets to work cooking for her, asking if she's thinking about applying to school, with a darkly funny line from Lecter. My dad killed girls at all the schools I applied to. Perhaps that can wait then. Abigail says she wants to work for the FBI, so of course Lecter loves the idea making sure once again to say she's not like her father when Abigail believes she couldn't join because of him. And Lecter vows to make thinking of him less painful. And how is he going to do that? Have you ever tried psilocybin? Mushrooms. Yes, magic mushrooms, of course. And you may notice that Hannibal giving drugs to Abigail to manipulate her mind is exactly what he did to Clarice Starling at the end of the Hannibal novel. In the film, it didn't do anything, but in the book, it very much did work. While the effect of the tea takes effect on Abigail, back at the FBI, Jack goes over the case, and they've discovered a distinct pattern of travel from the killer family. They don't have a lot to go on, but they have a rough idea of where the next murder might be and Will postulates that the kids may have Stockholm Syndrome. And he specifically puts it like this. You bond with your captor, you survive. You don't. Your breakfast. Once again, inadvertently connecting this case to Abigail's situation, despite the fact that even she doesn't realise it yet. And the cut back to Hannibal literally cooking breakfast makes the connection even stronger. And of course, Abigail is now off her face. She starts to think about her experiences with her father, including the killing of Nicholas Boyle, leading to her dropping the teacup, shattering it. Which is a big direct reference to the end of the Hannibal novel, as broken teacups are a big theme there. It's also a recurring theme for Abigail and Will's characters, because you'll remember this line from episode one. I think Uncle Jack sees you as a fragile little teacup. Hannibal tries to talk to Abigail about how the mushrooms will help her trauma, but she seems more interested in the fruit bowl. And conversation quickly changes to what's Hannibal cooking, which is high-life eggs and sausage. Hannibal moving to Spain for this recipe, or so he claims. We then get a bit of a trick. In the 19th century. Which, being a trained juggler, Mickelson pulls off with ease. Abigail notes that sausage and eggs was the last meal she was having with her parents, and Lecter is fully aware of this. 
So in my interpretation, he's trying to symbolize a death and rebirth for Abigail. The investigation has led to needle in a haystack tactics as Will, Katz and Bloom have a load of missing children cases and need to find the one that fits Will's profile. But the problem is, they still think the oldest, CJ, is the one responsible. But fortunately, Bloom gets them to start thinking about a surrogate mother too. Which is significant considering what's in store for her future. Will tells Jack what they've discovered, and again, he inadvertently references Abigail. Well, family can have a contagion effect on some people. Well, influences them to adopt similar behaviors and attitudes. And fortunately, they manage to catch the incident at the convenience store on CCTV, so they know exactly where the family is going to strike next. They will need to make haste, though, as the family has already started to make their move as the boy is reunited with his family, his mother happy to see him. We don't see much else of the family after the commercial break, but the SWAT team has mobilised. And you know it's serious, because Crawford is in full Morpheus mode. The team managed to stop the family from being killed, but one of the boys runs off with Will taking chase. The boy is still armed though, so it's not completely safe. However, Will tries to talk to him, and this happens. How was she able to move very slowly over to the child and take them hostage without a single command or action from not just Will, but the other SWAT guy that he's with? That just seems odd that it happened so easily. Will puts his gun down. Again, I think everyone has forgotten the heavily armoured and armed SWAT guy behind him. But fortunately, it's cats to the rescue shooting the mother and defusing the situation. It's not all sunshine and rainbows though, as Jack makes it clear to the boy that it's going to be a long process until he can see his family again, despite him saying he wasn't going to do it. And there may be a little insight into Crawford here when the boy tells him he doesn't know what family is like because he's got no children. The little pause he has is significant, I feel. Back with Hannibal, he's quite soundly getting told off by Bloom for taking Abigail out of the hospital without her permission and he's doing a good job of looking apologetic. It's possible it's not all an act. It's easy to assume that Hannibal doesn't care that he made Bloom angry, but I think he does in some way. Perhaps Lecter did what he did because he thought Bloom would think like he does, so he just took the initiative in his own way. But you could also say that that's being far too generous to Lecter. Hannibal doesn't help his case though when he lies that he had to sedate Abigail because she became distraught rather than admitting the mushroom use. Bloom showing up does seem to be part of his plan to mess with Abigail's mind in some way though as they all sit down to dinner and she sees them both as her parents, telling them that she sees family. Also, it's a nice attention to detail that Abigail has dilated pupils and the unblinking stare is quite creepy to say the least. We then finally get to meet Crawford's wife, played by Lawrence Fishburne's wife at the time, Gina Torres. And there's clear issues in the marriage, which is a little bit of life imitating art considering the divorce. But Crawford asks her if it's too late for them to have kids, to which his wife replies, it is for her, setting up a future subplot with Bella Crawford. And it's clear Jack wasn't really joking when he told Hannibal he would be diagnosing their marital troubles. And the episode ends with Will back at home falling asleep with his own surrogate family. This end kind of encapsulates the episode's theme of families. Or should that be broken families? With Abigail being indoctrinated into hers, Crawford having a strained relationship with his wife despite wanting a family, and Will arguably having no one despite being the most content, at least for now. So that was episode four, Earth. And I've been saying it this whole time, it's not that bad of an episode. The way it was released may have been a factor in how opinions formed about this episode, but when you explore it in its entirety, it works pretty well. And although it's still a murder of the week style episode, the murder works so well in connection to Abigail and Will and Hannibal, that it doesn't feel like two separate stories jammed together. And I'll say it again, this episode is so much better than the previous episode. 
Even if it's not as important for character development, the main thing is Hannibal expertly manipulating all around him, laying the groundwork for later. And a lot of it you don't even notice until it comes full circle later on down the line, making this episode in some ways quite necessary as well. Thank you so much for watching. I'd like to give a massive thank you to all my Patreon donators. Their support really does help a lot. And if you would like to contribute to the channel and gain access to the Deus Deacon Reviews Discord server, the link is in the description below. And if you would like to get more content aside from the reviews, please consider checking out the Twitch channel, where I stream live 5 days a week, 9pm GMT, with subjects ranging from Let's Plays, discussions and watch party nights. So join me live, where I am very much a team player. Shit, I'm gonna die. You just killed me, you bastard. But it's a, it's functional, for God's sake. You son of a bitch. At least my grave floats. It's not the Chelsea Flowers Show. It's it's Valheim, for God's sake. It doesn't have to look pretty, just as long as it fucking works. You made that impossible. I couldn't do that. You tried, you killed me, you bastard. The link is in the description below, so hopefully I will see you there. And on YouTube, I'll see you next time.